I'm Mason Mount. You're listening to the London is Blue podcast. Welcome back, Chelsea fans, to a special episode we've got going on here. As always, you've got myself, Brandon, Dan, and Nick joining me. Uh, Dan, sorry, you're going to have to wait. I'm skipping ahead right to Nick because, Nick, special pod, special guest. What do we have in store for the listeners? Absolutely. Hey, uh, we're just we're really excited to welcome one of our inspirations for starting this podcast. So apologies to everyone else who's had to listen over the years. Uh, one half of the Men in Blazers, Michael Davis, welcome to the London is Blue podcast. Well, I am delighted to be on London is Blue. I would not be on London is Red. I would not be on London is White. I would not be on Watford is Yellow. I would not be in London is Claret and Blue. Only London is Blue. I'm delighted to be here, guys. Well, we are obviously hugely excited uh, to get this one off. And so just for our listeners out there, we're going to kick off with, obviously, we want to get, you know, Davo's side of his Chelsea history. I mean, that's why we connect so deeply. Um, And then we'll also talk about a little bit of media, Men and Blazers, and kind of his role and his path there. And hopefully we have a little bit of time at the end for some lightning round. So again... Uh, buckle in. It's going to be a fun conversation. I can I can assure you. And what better way, David, to start it off than, you know, just at the beginning, kind of, you know, what brought you to being a Chelsea fan? And do you even, I guess, do you remember your first match at Stamford Bridge? I do. So I, you know, I'm born in 1966 and really fell in love with football. Great year for England. A great year for England. I was three months old. Don't remember a lot about the World Cup, but I'm sure... <laughs> I'm sure that the ball crossed the line. That's the only thing I know at three months, I'm sure of. But, at, um, you know, when I was four, five years old, 1970, 1971, those were vintage Chelsea seasons. Um, you know, it was the, uh, the FA Cup win in that amazing replay um, midweek against Leeds United. It was the, um, the Cup Winners Cup, that amazing uh, win in 1971. These were golden Chelsea years when they'd gone so long without a title. And, you know, there was very little football on television when we were kids. We just didn't have like Rebecca Lowe and the two Robbies like bring me his TV <laughs> every week. Um, but the FA Cup was on and the European competitions were on. And Chelsea was one of the only teams that therefore were on for a young four, five year old boy really getting into football. And I fell in love with them. Simultaneously, my dad, who couldn't stand football, had no interest in taking me to my local teams, which were Charlton, Millwall, Mm -hmm. Crystal Palace, partly because they were all too dangerous and none of them were very good. But my uncle, who lived in South Kensington, right next door to Chelsea, Mm -hmm. would take me up to Chelsea, would take me up to, um, uh, would take me to Fulham actually, because Chelsea and Fulham play on alternate weekends. But I was always a blue. My mom actually uh, bought me, it was before you could buy like kits for kids, but my mom, found a pair of blue shorts and sewed a white piping down the side. It was back when we had the fairly thick white stripe down the shorts in the seventies. And she made me that. And then an aunt up in Scotland sent me a Rangers Jersey, the the full blue Rangers Jersey. And my first Chelsea kit was a pair of shorts that my mum made and a Rangers Jersey. And that was my Chelsea kit in which I pretended to be Peter Osgood. um, And who was my favorite player back then, you know, classic number nine. Um, And that was that. My first game, I wrote about it in this book. I think it was Coventry. Um, We're looking at like 1972, 1973. I don't remember a lot about it. Stamford Bridge was not the Stamford Bridge it is today, back then. The game I really remember was 76, 77. I remember watching Chelsea play Bristol City. And my uncle was a closet Bristol City fan because he lived in Bristol. And uh, Bristol City had this amazing player called Jeff Merrick, who was their centre back. Curly perm, um, looked like Rogers a teenager. Um, <laughs> and Jeff Merrick was the single best footballer I'd seen in my life at that point. He was a ball playing centre back, who was the captain of Bristol City. I remember being more impressed with him than all the Chelsea sides. You know, football was terrible in the 1970s. It was muddy, it was violent, both on the pitch and in the crowd and outside the ground. Even the police horses were threatening. Um, but I fell in love with the blue. It was the blue of Chelsea. It was blue as the color. It was the a much deeper blue. They've actually started making the kit deeper blue now, which I love. Um, but I fell in love and I was Chelsea from a very early age and then all the way through. But, you know, Chelsea weren't good. We were in the second division a lot of the time. We were 
never really after 70, 71, we didn't really compete for any major titles until the 1990s again when we got good and started to win a boatload after Ruth Kulik came in and um, Viali and, you know, the great size of Jimmy Floyd Hasselbank. Um, and in the Premier League era, my fandom's only become larger and I love it. I'm emotional about the club. I'm emotional about our history. I loathe I loathe the snobbery of other teams, of the idea that they own all history. Manchester United, Liverpool fans, Chelsea have none. Chelsea have plenty of history. Um, and look, we've been the most successful side in football for, um, you know, since 2004, 2005. Man City are catching up very, very fast. But Chelsea fans have nothing to be ashamed of in terms of our history, in terms of what we've contributed to the game, both domestically and globally, we've played beautiful football, beautiful football through our uh, through our history, and had some phenomenal, phenomenal uh, players. Um, and Gianfranco Zola is a god, or maybe the son of God. And uh, <laughs> to have seen him play at Stamford Bridge is one of the great sporting and cultural and religious religious experiences in my life. So you. you- you almost teed up the next question perfectly because you mentioned Zola. You talked a little bit about Peter Osgood and the prototypical number nine that he was. We were going to ask who your top three favorite Chelsea players were of all time. Are those one and two, and now there's a third you'd like to add, or are you going to kind of change it up a little bit? I feel like your third has to change all the time, but I will say that... um, they're probably not my favorite Chelsea players of all time. And I'm going to go a little bit more. Um, I'm going to go a little bit more recent. I'm actually going to say my favorite Chelsea players, the players who literally brought me out of my seat. Zola is number one. Zola literally brought me out of a seat and more recent Chelsea fans who've, you know, become fans of the club in the, you know, more recent Premier League in the, what I like to refer to as the NBC sports Premier League era. Mm. Um, they won't have seen Gianfranco Zola play a lot. And Zola was, just a magician. He was unbelievable and captivating. And, you know, he's been back at the club since um, in a coaching capacity, but what a player he was. He was phenomenal. I'd say my second uh, uh, favorite player in the history of Chelsea is probably Joe Cole. You know, didn't grow up at Chelsea, but loved watching him play for the club. He got me out of my seat. I watched him play for England all over the world as well. Joe Cole could do things with the football. I just always rooted for him so hard. I always wanted him to be so good. He was almost to me like an English Zola. He had all of that ability. Um, And then I got to use a current squad player. And for me, this is a tie. If you'd have asked me this four weeks ago, I'd have been like Ruben Loftus-Cheek. He's from the London borough of Lewisham, uh, where I was born. Um, He's from my my manor, as we say in South London. Um, (laughs) I think he is a player who we have just scratched the surface on how good he's going to be for Chelsea and for England. If he can just, you know, God willing, stay injury free. I think he is phenomenal. But in the last four weeks, I have become, along with my son, George, who's a massive Chelsea fan, I have become a Mason Mount obsessive. It's like... How can't you? It's it's like, uh, it, it's like I've never been into boy bands, but like Mason Mount is an entire boy band for me. He is so perfect. He is, he's like, I do believe he is the son of Frank Lampard. I think we're going to find that out at some point, uh, that Frank Lampard is his dad. Is his dad. He is beautiful. He works so hard. He came up through the academy. He's just, he's just a story waiting to happen. And he's my favorite kind of Premier League player. He's a player who plays between the lines. Um, he's just got a great name, Double M, Mason Mount. That's like... Um, that's like a writer. That's like Martin Amis couldn't have named a Premier League footballer better than, better than Mason Mount. And so he is really, I'm so excited to watch him play every single time. And I think he's going to play a lot under this manager. Yeah, he has the, the Hollywood smile for sure. Uh, oh. he's, he's, he's made for prime time. I, on that note, I mean, you're, you're a pro and you're segueing perfectly. Uh, we know it's early days uh, for, for this regime, uh, for Frank. Uh, what do you make of the Mason Mounts of the world, the Tammy Abrahams, Fukuyo Tamori, Ruben, hopefully when he gets healthy, uh, and so on and so forth? What do you make of their rise? Is, is it making you kind of even more kind of ingrained in the club to kind of have some of our own come through? 
Oh, look, what has been the greatest frustration being a Chelsea fan over the last few administrations? You know, whether it's Mourinho, um, certainly under Sarri, and like the the uh, rotating cast of international managers who've come through is they've never trusted in youth. We have this amazing academy and now we're bringing through these players. We've all dreamed of it. You know, the results have been, you know, we've won one game away at Norwich. Um, but I'm not sure that I've enjoyed an opening four games of the season and a Super Cup, whatever that was, that we played against Liverpool. I've enjoyed these five games, only one of which we've won more than uh, any opening five games in the history, in my history of watching Chelsea, because we're playing the babies and I love seeing the babies play. And most of these babies grew up playing at Chelsea. We've got an American baby. We've got, you know, a couple of other babies who are playing on this team. But um, look, to see Tammy being able to score at Premier League level, you know, I, I said this thing on the podcast the other day, it's very often with football, we react so heavily to the, to the cycle that goes on that week. We're trying to win arguments in the pub against Arsenal fans and Liverpool fans and United fans and, and if City fans, if you can find them. Um, <laughs> but there are... Um, we often have to separate what's interesting from what's important. There are lots of interesting storylines, but what's important? And I've got to tell you, what's important for Chelsea this season is the long-term faith in Frank Lampard. And nothing is going to secure his future more. And I've met, um, uh, been fortunate enough to meet Roman Abramovich a few times. Nothing is more important to him, I can tell you, than seeing that Frank has unearthed Tammy Abraham and Mason Mount as Premier League quality midfielders and strikers. Like we have a Premier League quality striker who is, oh my God, and with that style of play, he's going to score a lot of goals in the Premier League. That's more important than a lot of the interesting storylines. Yeah, it's really interesting that Norwich have a Finnish striker that's scoring goals. That's interesting. I don't know in the history of Norwich whether that's going to be super important. I could be wrong. I just don't think it's going to be super important. I think Tammy netting four times for Chelsea at the beginning of the season, proving he can do in the Premier League what he did in the Championship for Villa, I think that's important. And so, look, and I love seeing Tamori play. I saw him play for England's under-21s. He's a very good player. You know, I'm um, fascinated um, to see what happens when Ruben gets back. Christian, you know, the, you know, the, uh, you know, a player who's so familiar to Americans, not that familiar yet to people uh, in Britain or even global fans of Chelsea. But I think he's had a solid start. I don't think it's been better than solid. It hasn't been spectacular, but I think he's solid. We've got Callum Hudson-Odoi about to come back. And it's, it's so wonderful to watch every week. Wonderful. You know, you know we, we feel lucky that, uh, you know, we've got to sit down with Ruben Loftus-Cheek and then we have to be one up again by your stories and then the fact that we even <laughs> got a glimpse of roman in boston and you're like yeah i've talked to him you're like all right well we're not gonna try to one up dave on anything here we're oh, just no, gonna by stick the way to the can facts. i just tell you better than that i met roman on his boat oh, oh there you go. What? <laughs> uh on eclipse on the big one and the, the all i can say is the tender the boat that takes you to his boat <laughs> <laughs> was already the biggest boat I'd ever been on. And that was just the tender that took you to the boat. It was just the most remarkable thing. Anyway. Oh, uh, what I mean, what a common folk story that is that we can yeah, just all, me. all understand. Relatable, you know. Man of the people. <laughs> just remember, <laughs> exactly. I grew up in South London. I grew up in nothing. So it's, Hey, we've uh, been to Selhurst Park. Roman. Yeah, we, I know. <laughs> we've been that's, down there. That's a nice part of my neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Context helps. So obviously, you know, as you were talking about, you know, Pulisic, when it was, we were actually in London when it was announced last January. And it was great to kind of wake up to that breaking news, knowing that all of our, you know, fellow Americans are six hours of sleep behind us. And the excitement and everything that we had was great. But then when he finally joined the team and you see him in preseason and with Frank, I mean, that's when it really hit me and the excitement finally happened. Obviously, you just gave us your, your I think, very fair assessment that he's had a solid start to his Chelsea career. Um, so if we move past that, knowing the Premier League fans like you do, what do you think the bar is for Pulisic so he can kind of get over the stigma of just being an American or maybe establish himself as a proper Premier League player? 
Do you know, it, it's, um, I actually feel bad for Christian that so much pressure is put on him and pressure is put on for two reasons. One, that Americans have racked so much and after the sort of, you know, Freddie Adu flame outs, the non-qualification for, you know, the, the, the World Cup against TNT, is there is, there is so much wrapped up in the American soccer fans' almost psyche and confidence in how well Christian does at Chelsea. And it's almost like, and sometimes when you speak to American soccer fans, they want Christian to have succeeded already rather than allowing to sit back and watch it happen. And I've had so many conversations with friends of mine who, will, who are massive Pulisic fans who will say things like, he's the greatest American to ever play in the Premier League. And I'm being like, not yet he isn't. Like, give him a chance to go and prove it. You know, right now, Clint Dempsey is the greatest American to ever play in the Premier League. Or Tim Howard is the greatest American to ever play in the Premier League. He's got to go and do it. And we've got to sit back and allow him to go and perform. And I think he has the ability to do it. And I don't think he's actually going to be judged very much. I don't think he's going to be... There's something about Christian that is not, like, stereotypically American. He's not super brash. He's not super loud. He doesn't... Um, he's almost unassuming. He's almost timid in some ways. He has the great gift of speed. When you watch him play live, he is an electric runner. He moves at speed. He has tremendous skill. And clearly, people on that team like him. You can see the body language of a Ross Barkley or of Mason Mount. You can see that he's playing around a lot of young kids, not around a lot of older season pros who are going to be tougher. He's playing around a lot of kids of his own age who he can probably relate to, and they seem to be pretty happy. I think the issues for him, and I think my question marks going forward are, I think he's got into the team as an automatic selection almost in the last few weeks, either as off the bench or as a starter. And I think when Callum Hudson-Odoi comes back and Pedro and William are back fully fit, I'm not sure that he's an automatic starter. And this may sound like heresy. I'm not even sure he's on the bench every week because I think they're going to rotate that squad and I think they're going to give people a chance to gel to go and find the best lineup. So he's going to have to start, you know, but this is what professional sports is like. He's going to have to start contributing more and heavier and that should make him a better player. If he's as good as we all think he is, he will overcome those things and he will make it, but it's not going to be a straight line to success. You know, the number of people telling me it's going to be a 20 goal season for Christian Pulisic. I'm like, you're out of your mind. He's not going to score 20 goals this season. You know, if he gets 10 assists and like seven goals, that's a really good season for, for that's a, he's like a starter in the Premier League if he gets that. Uh, and I think there's this expectation because of the size of his contract, because the player he's, um, you know, replacing in some ways Eden Hazard and because of just the hopes that Americans have in him, which I totally understand, that it's putting more pressure on him to go and move faster. He's a young guy. He's got, he needs to have a solid year and then explode in his second year or his third year. I don't know. I'm interested in what you guys think about it, honestly. That's almost like a, a redshirt year for someone coming into uh, to college, right? Typically, they would get an opportunity to sit back, watch a little bit, acclimatize to it appropriately. And he's had to be thrown in at the end of it all, just with the the chaos that always happens around Chelsea, just a little bit more chaos this season than most. And I, I think I, we would agree with you that ultimately we have a player who is going to need time to progress and improve and acclimatize the league. And I know Nick has mentioned that quite frequently, that we would – uh, you know, just be patient with him in the way that uh, will garner eventually the right level of success. And yeah, I would, definitely. I would follow up and say, like, your your ten assists, seven goals is almost dead in line with what I think we all thought would be a, a, a reasonable start to his his campaign. I mean, he already has two assists, so he's kind of well on the way there. And I, I think he's Does had, he had a two in the Premier League. I think he has one, right? Yeah, uh, he got the credit for this, the first Tammy goal against Sheffield because he charged yes. the ball. So, yeah. So, uh, like, again, it, it's going to be a while, though. I think Brandon even has, has kind of given this opinion uh, as well on the show that we – I think we want to so badly root for an American who is such a good contributor in the Premier League week in, week out, and it's just going to take a minute. 
Yeah, without a doubt. You know, what I'm looking up as we're talking is I'm trying to figure out what Eden Hazard did his first season in the Premier League, you know? Um, and I don't think it was huge, you know? First season in the Premier League, he had nine goals. That was Eden Hazard's first season in the Premier League. You know, that was outstanding start, you know, and he grew from there, 14, 14, 4, 16, 12, 16. You know, that's a, um, that's a lot in the Premier League, you know. And, you know, he's going to have a chance to, you know, play Champions League, which he has some experience. He's going to play Carabao Cup. He's going to play FA Cup. He's going to play in some other competitions as well. And um, I just hope he gets a chance. I think that the fans at Stamford Bridge are, like, excited. You know, he's part of that nucleus of young players, and I think they're excited about what he can contribute. I think he looks a little... I don't know what you think. I think he looks a little, um, two things which I think he's got to work on is I think he looks a little defensively naive. I think he's been asked to play a lot more defense than maybe it's a tougher league than the Bundesliga and he's going to have to play a lot more defense. And in that position, when you're a wide player in the Premier League, you have a lot of defensive responsibility. And secondly, I think he needs to fill out. I think he needs to gain a little bit of weight. He needs to get bigger because this is a tough, tough league it's very very physical and I think being a wing player he's going to get taken out a lot he's going to get shoulder checked a lot and he's going to get shoulder checked early before he gets a chance to go and and take people on so I think we're going to see him fill out but I agree it's a first season you know similar to our manager this is a free pass I think a lot of people talk about the expectation of the contract on him or the expectation of of replacing Eden I don't think he has to do be any more than solid in his first year I think that's all he has to do I think the team have to be Solid. Same for Frank Lampard. This is a free year. We're getting to experiment with the young players. Next season, I think, will be a bigger question about everybody. So having seen four matches now, or five matches, with the Super Cup, what's your adjusted end-of-the-season expectation for Chelsea when you think about league position, who that top scorer is, and then you know how many cups we potentially might win? Because I, maybe not the Premier League, but obviously we do have the option of winning maybe a domestic cup in uh in these competitions we can win a european cup you pessimist we can do that too strange <laughs> well, things I mean, have happened interesting that you know the the year we won the champions league we finished sixth in the league you know mm-hmm. that's an amazing um and look and chelsea i think have already proven against liverpool when we played them in the super cup that for i actually think we were unlucky not to win that game um and we certainly, it goes down as a loss statistically. It was a tie, two all after extra time. And no one has come close to Liverpool. You know, we're, we're playing one of the best teams in the world, if not the best team in the world, very well. So I don't have much of an adjustment. I still think Chelsea are going to finish top four. I think Chelsea are going to finish fourth in the league. Um, I think Man City and Liverpool are better than us. And I think that one of Tottenham, Arsenal, or Man U will get their act together. My guess is, even though it doesn't look like it right now, it's my guess is it's going to be Tottenham because Tottenham have proven a proven goal scorer and multiple proven goal scorers. And I think in the Premier League, that's too important week in, um, week out. Uh, And a manager who is brilliant. So... But I think Chelsea still have the ability to finish top four, despite that first week loss to Man U, which I almost put an asterisk against. Um, only because it was the first game of the season and Man United played out of their skins. They certainly played better than they played any other match this season um, and finished spectacularly. Um, so I think we still finish fourth. In terms of like cups, um, League Cups, you know, Chelsea always do well in these competitions and I think we'll do well in them again. Um, But I think you're going to see Frank experiment. You know, already he's bringing in players that you literally have to check your notes and figure out who they are, who he's bringing on the pitch in these games. And it's fascinating. We haven't like dealt with anything like that for for years, you know. The most exciting thing that used to happen at Chelsea is John Obi Mikel used to get a run around for about 15 (laughs) minutes. Like we don't... The closer. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. We're getting... um, we're seeing exciting things happen. And we've still got Rudiger to come back from injury. We've got Ruben loftus G coming back. We've got Callum Hudson-Odoi um, coming back. There are still, by the way, we might see Marco van Ginkel. Like there are things that are going to happen at Chelsea that are, that are exciting. Conte. 
Obviously, we need him back. To oh, my fitness. God. At full fitness, that makes a massive yeah. difference. I mean, because Chelsea have looked... You know, one of the reasons that the games have been exciting offensively is that we've had absolutely no defence whatsoever. And the big reason for yeah. that is about, is about Kante. So, um, fancy a chance at top score? Right now, I think it would be crazy to bet against Tammy. You know, clearly he's the manager's choice. He has... You know, I think it was bold. I thought Batshuayi had a great preseason, and he's not even seeing a minute. Mm-hmm. Um, Giroud is off this, off the, he sees that as, a, as, a, as an option B. I think Tammy's going to play a striker. I think he's going to get a lot of surface, uh, service. And he's one of those goal scorers. He's a poacher, and he's lethal from inside the box. You know, it's amazing. When you shoot in the corner away from the goalkeeper. It's amazing how many goals you score. That's how Harry Kane scores so many goals. He, he shoots the ball, not right at the goalkeeper, away from the goalkeeper, but still on the frame of the goal. That is amazing now, how now you can hold, actually score a goal. Hold on there. I know. Uh, let's, not, let's not exaggerate how to score goals. I mean, typically I thought you would kick it straight at the goalkeeper and hope he missed, you know? Believe me, we've had a lot of strikers who've done that <laughs> over the years. Um, but uh, that is not... That is not what Tabby does. He tries to avoid the goalkeeper and hit it within the frame of the goal. And go figure, Tammy scores goals like that. I think the interesting thing is we've got to see we've got to see some non-English players contribute. Like all of our goals are being scored by English people, which is very non-Chelsea. Uh, we need we need to see two things that always happen. We need to see continental players deliver. We've got to see somebody um, start to score goals who we don't expect to, and that could be Christian. That would be amazing if it was Christian. Um, and I think we've got to see some more contribution from our defense. And that's where Rudiger could come in. We don't look very good from um, corner kicks right now. We don't look that dangerous from set pieces. Um, so I'd like to see that improve. I think Chelsea are going are gonna to need that. I think Zuma can probably contribute some goals at the other end. I think that would be nice. Um, but we, we should be able to like, get some goals that way. Yeah, I guess that's the downside of not having 67 different set piece plays this season. But, you know, they'll, they'll get there, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. They'll get there. Yeah, most of which involve passing the ball backwards and Jorginho somehow being involved. I also think that one other caution, you know, I'd say that one of my worries is that Dave, um, as per the Quetta, has looked not that good this season. I don't know what's going on in Dave land, but there's something going on in Dave land that is not quite right because he's been so solid for us for so long. And suddenly Dave, with the captain's armband, is looking like so many goals are coming from his side. It's alarming to me. It's, uh, it, it, it is going to be interesting to see if a little rotation comes in or if, or if he's given you know a couple of matches off here or there to see if he comes back stronger. I mean, I think when Reese comes back, it's another one that's coming back. Yeah. It's going to be the first real challenge for his position – maybe since he's been at the club, you know, like he unseated Ashley Cole and has basically played every match since. Yeah. So, you know, I think his legs are a little, probably a little tired. And, you know, I'm also, I, I believe in his fiery spirit. Um, yeah. You know, I, I think he's just, he's a leader and I think he's going to come back. Yeah. Although Frank might make his son Mason Mount baby captain. <laughs> I could see him making him the baby captain and be the youngest captain in the history of the club. Just I like a, little, a baby captain. A little B yeah, over the C. BC. Lower yeah. KC and then yeah. a, a upper KC. <laughs> yeah, BC. Baby captain. So I guess kind of your evolution, you know, into the media, I guess like how has going from a just a fan, right, maybe more of a private life, uh, to being a commentator, whether the season is 138th of the way done or 38 38ths of the way complete, yeah. how has that changed, if at all, how you watch and enjoy Chelsea. Maybe more oh tweets God. after a match. <laughs> that is such a good, that is such a good question. Um, and it's definitely still something that's in process. You know, I started, you know, this has been a hobby for me. Um, football has been a hobby my entire life. It's sort of away from, as a kid, away from schoolwork. It was never my number one sport um, as a player. I played football. I played football to a pretty good level, but I was a, uh, I was a, a tennis player and that's how I first came to America playing tennis and that was my sport. Um, but I loved football and loved it all the way through college and would go to every game I possibly could. 
and then came to America and football got left behind because 1989, Orlando, Florida, there's not a lot of, I went to see the Orlando Lions play at the Citrus Bowl, but there was not a lot of soccer. There was no internet. Um, and I really lost soccer. I used to have to like call home and figure out what was going on with Chelsea, what the results were. I, there was another way to like really figure it out. Um, and since I've gone into the media, I started writing about football for ESPN in 2002. I covered World Cups in 02 and 06 and 10 when I was introduced to Roger. Um, and I still kept my fandom like fully there. Definitely since we launched Men in Blazers, it definitely dulled. You become so obsessed with trying to find story and trying to find content to be funny about. You're not so obsessed with what happens with your team on a weekly basis. It just is you're focused on the show. You're not focused on being a fan. What's so nice about doing this podcast actually with you guys is that we can just talk about fandom and we're in a safe space where we can love Chelsea together. <laughs> when you're on the podcast with Roger, who just, he, Roger loathes Chelsea. Like he has imbued Chelsea with all the things that have threatened him in his life um, <laughs> and imaginary fears. And he's put them all in Chelsea and he honestly views Chelsea as the embodiment of pure evil. Um, and it's just, it's exhausting most of the time. I mean, I actually see Everton as the embodiment of pure boredom and pointlessness. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a fairly equal, um, it's a fairly sort of equal matchup. But it's no fun talking to Roger about a Chelsea match. Zero. I didn't realize that it was his Pennywise. That's, uh, that's quite unfortunate for him. Yeah, yeah. And so it's either... So whether Chelsea win or lose or draw, it's no fun talking about it with Roger. And so it's definitely dulled some of that. Weirdly, and then at the same time, over successive seasons of Men in Blazers, Chelsea have had remarkable success, which is great. I love watching us win trophies, even the Europa League. Like, I enjoy it. You know, it's just... Yeah. And beating Arsenal in Baku. Oh, yeah. And it's so fun. So fun to beat Arsenal in the Europa League. So I've loved watching us win so much, but I haven't liked the rotation of managers. I haven't liked the fact that we haven't played in the academy players. I haven't, um, I haven't really been obsessed with, you know, Chelsea players and some of the greats from that 04, 05, 05, 06 um, team left. And so to get back now, Frank back at the club, these kids playing, I feel more rejuvenated than ever. I've, as I said, I've enjoyed these first five games of the season more than the beginning of the season ever. I think it's a very exciting time to be a Chelsea fan. Amen. So, uh, Michael, when we're talking about uh, Men in Blazers, how do you think, you know, over the nine years that you've been doing it and producing wow. it, which is crazy to think about, um, are there any moments or things that you reflect upon it that you've enjoyed doing the most or being able to contribute to the, uh, the soccer community as it is? Saka. I mean, look, I think the remarkable moment for Men in Blazers was, I think we made a pretty good podcast for the first four years of its existence. And we, um, you know, did a couple of live shows and, you know, it was a really good hobby. But then I think when we persuaded ESPN to send us to the World Cup in 2014 and, you know, we covered that World Cup in pretty miserable conditions. But at the, the same pan, time, the panic room, panic room at the same, the closet, Bob Lee's closet, at the same time that it was miserable, I knew that it was so good. And I could really tell, I've been around a lot of hit TV shows and I could just tell from the feedback that was happening back home, the way we were being used by ESPN, even sitting across from Roger and just feeling the content, I could tell that it was, it had become a hit. And that was, that was an that was an incredible moment, and really, once we got back in fourteen, that's when. And bizarrely, ESPN would put the Men in Blazers logo on the um, Sports Center rundown, and they didn't even own Men in Blazers. They just promoted our brand for an entire World Cup. Um, that was that was phenomenal. That was a a big change, and where we were part of the conversation, and we were part of this sort of celebration of that ridiculous tournament in Brazil. I think that was a big moment. And then joining NBC and watching and suddenly realizing, wow, NBC are covering the Premier League right. You know, I'm yet to meet an American Premier League fan who 
who has said to me, you know what, I don't really like the job that NBC are doing with the Premier League. I haven't met a single person who's ever said that. So being part of that broadcast team, you know, we're friends with all the talent. We got on so well with Rebecca and um, the Robbies and Arlo and, and Kyle. Like We're just close with these guys and all the people behind the scenes. So I think those two things really stick out. And as we've toured around the country and met all of our fans, including, you know, you know, you guys have been to some of our live shows and met you at Oklahoma Joe's, Nick. It's a, right. in, uh, in, in, in Kansas City, it's a, um, uh, it's just been a, it's been a remarkable, it's been a remarkable, um, it's been a remarkable journey. And it, it's actually means a lot it's ended up meaning a lot more to me than so many other things in my career that I've done that have been successful that I've done behind the scenes. I don't particularly love being on camera. I love producing. I love being behind the camera. I actually see what I do on Men in Blazers as part of it producing Rog because Rog is so talented, dark, difficult, <laughs> intense, but super talented. Um, that uh, I, thought I don't love being on camera, but I love the fans. I love speaking to people. I love being. I love being around. I love being around the community. So let's let's take the NBC uh, part of it because I mean it's after the 2014 World Cup. You guys kind of made the transition over, and you know you were talking about you know, the production quality, which is absolutely outstanding. Mm-hmm. Um, how was that moment for you? Like you clearly had kind of reached you know the top of what you were doing at ESPN, and then you made a, a pretty significant move for a podcast video offering at that time to go to another network. Um, how, how did that, how did that all come about? And like, how, how do you feel like that's helped you guys potentially grow um, after that world cup? Well, I think to some extent it was our fans who made it happen because our fans started following us and they really made it impossible for NBC or ESPN or Fox not to offer to bring us on their air all the time. And, um, I think one of the key decisions we made, which I wish that all podcasters made when they moved their podcast to television, is that we don't try to make our podcast on TV. Our TV show is very different from our podcast. And we still do our podcast. We actually don't even video our podcast. We, I'm actually watching this thinking, we should do this. This is really good. Why don't we do this? Um, in fact, it'd be great. Rog and I could sit in different places and do it. I wouldn't even have to be in the same room. It's wonderful. <laughs> but um, we, um, the TV show is very different. It's very written. It's very fast moving. It's based on clips. It's a very different experience. Um, and so... That has been good. And at the same time, we've broadened out all the other offerings. So there's, you know, the live shows, the touring shows, the, um, uh, the newsletter, the merchandise we do, the book we wrote. And we don't view anything. We don't really view Men in Blazers as any of those things. We don't think, oh, we've got a TV show, and then we do all of this other stuff on the side. We view everything as equal as important, all of the content as important as each other. And in fact, I probably had to choose, which is the biggest, it's the podcast which we make no revenue from whatsoever, but it drives the entire brand. That's where we build the connection with fans. Um, and that has been really, uh, that's been really significant. And I love, I don't know how you guys feel. I love doing the podcast each week. Oh yeah. So, I mean, we, this is what we, we've shown up for. I mean, we started on a whim, honestly. I didn't even pressed record on the first episode and these guys came back. That's true. So, he didn't. <laughs> it, you know, for us to be in our sixth season covering Chelsea exclusively, hmm. it, I mean, it's it's been amazing. And it's provided us, obviously, friendships that are deeper than we ever would have imagined, connections. We've interviewed players, been to Stanford Bridge. I mean, it's just opened up all these um, opportunities. But most importantly, like you said, it's these fan connections. Like Our goal is really just to use this to create a bigger community of Chelsea fans and kind of spread the good word and bring more people in. Um and that's exactly, you know, the way we look at it. So, I mean, from your perspective, how do you feel podcasts have helped grow the game in the United States? I think they're kind of, I think they're bigger here in America than other parts of the world, but yeah, they're obviously well, catching up quickly. Well, look, the podcast business um, is much bigger in the U.S. than anywhere else in the world. In fact, the only country in the world where podcasts are kind of a big deal is China, but they're very different. They're a 
they almost have educational podcasts. So if you want a very deep, in-depth Chelsea educational podcast, there's probably a Chinese one. Um, but uh, yeah, I think podcasts have been part of the community. Look, I think that I think that the Premier League coming to this stage of maturity um, in the internet era, in the era of social media, in the era of NBC getting their act together, in the era of EA Sports FIFA, I think there have been a lot of technological things that have really helped the rise of the game. And let's face it, the American soccer fan is a little bit different than the soccer, the typical football fan in England or around the rest of the world. You know, I've said a couple of times on the podcast that the US would win the middle class World Cup. You know, we are <laughs> we are the best middle class soccer nation in the world. Our middle classes could beat everybody else around the world. You know, soccer is a very working class sport, and in America, it's a very middle class, somewhat nerdy. You know, there's definitely a choice to be a Premier League fan that you've got to sort of go against the sort of huh, barstool American sports center. Um, and so nerdy guys in America listen to podcasts. So it, it kind of, um, and often produce them or often are in them. And so it's a, I think it's definitely being part of the contributor. Well, there, there's a, a, there's a good joke out there that, you know, what do you call a group of guys in their thirties and it's a podcast. I mean, yeah. that's yeah. essentially what it is, right? Yeah, pretty true. As you think about the impact that you and Raj have had on the growth of fandom here in the U.S., you know, is there one or two inflection points that you kind of can think about as being like turning points for the growth of the game here? Have you seen like being able to kind of paint out the ripples from something you did and how that's changed fandom a bit? Yeah, I actually don't think Rog and I would ever claim to have had anything to do with the rise of the game in the U.S. I think that we... We're, we're really claiming good. that. We're no, claiming that. I think <laughs> we've had really good... I think we've had really good timing of being around the rise of the game. Um, I would put us collectively as a small part of NBC Sports coverage, and I think NBC Sports coverage has been a huge accelerator for the game in the U.S., and I think that what Men in Blazers do is a little bit of that. And I think we do help fans, particularly newer fans, access storylines and characters through comedy, um, mainly on our TV show. But on our podcast, a lot of the special things that Roger does, the docs he makes for NBC, the interviews, the special pod interviews he does, is that, you know, there is a, despite the, the insanity, the sort of almost Monty Python quality of Men in Blazers, we cover soccer quite in depth and quite seriously. And we've spoken to nearly every manager, nearly every player, nearly every owner. We're very connected at every league around the world, every ownership group. We are, we're very connected in that world of football. But we do help to translate it and break it down and make it easier to access and build it into storylines and, and characters. But I don't think that's really helped. Um, I don't think those have been the significant drivers of the game in the US. I think football, and one thing I think people often ignore, football is so much better than it used to be. You know, in the 70s and 80s, the game was hard to watch. It wasn't very good. The game has got superb. The pitches are superb. The training is superb. You know, players don't smoke 60 cigarettes every single day like they used to. It's a, these players are super fit. They, um, they're tactically so aware. The, the data that the teams use to sort of scout opponents is, is so phenomenal. The quality from the top to the bottom of the league is so, is, is so good. And I think that the game just needed a great outlet. Um, and I think it, I think it, I think it got it. Um, and I think we're just fortunate enough to be able to honestly, all of us, all four of us here to get to cover it and be part of the media that covers this interesting game. And it's every single week, it gets better and better and better. We get just new clubs come in, new storylines, more managers. I mean, my God, Steve Bruce is back. Like it's so good. It's like it couldn't be better. As, as a quick follow, do you feel like Americans understand British humor more because of Men in Blazers? Um, I think that uh, I think that Men in Blazers definitely the humor is quite British, and I think at the same time I think we know how to translate it into American. But I do think we we sit in a long line of. I mean, Roger and I, before we go on the show, we, we often like play clips on YouTube of old British comedies to each other. We listen to old songs. We, we, we do stuff. And um, 
I definitely think there's a very, um, there is certainly a portion of our fans who are fans of sort of their Anglophilia comedy fans. Like they, they love all that kind of stuff. Okay. So a, a quick question about one of our all time favorite broadcasters, which is Bob Lee. Oh, uh, he absolutely, I mean, is unbelievable. the general. Yep. Yeah. He, uh, he retired recently from ESPN after a just astonishing 40 year career. Mm-hmm. Um, you guys always gave him the love he deserved on the podcast yeah. and, and obviously gave him the, the first ever golden blazer in 2014. Yeah. Describe, you know, you, you can't go into it fully, but describe his impact in the game, um, or on the game in the United States. I mean, it's, it has to be untold, right? Well, look, he's been there at everything, you know, he was there in 1950, um, you know, and when the U S beat England in the world cup, that's a joke. He wasn't there. Uh, after I joked that he was there in 1865, but that game when Princeton played against Rutgers and what's seen as being the earliest game in American football was probably the earliest game in, in, uh, in sort of American soccer. He's, but he's been there. He's been talking about soccer on television since way before it was even like remotely popular. He's been obsessed with it since he was growing up in New Jersey. No one did more at ESPN to go and push the game. Um, he has an understanding of the game that is that is phenomenal. The, the global tectonic plates. He understands the broadcasting of it. He understands the American contributions to it. He understands what America lacks. Um, he just has that enthusiasm. He embraced us so early at ESPN when many others didn't and took us very seriously as we took him seriously. And just a a the general, a general of a man. Um, I'm worried that sports broadcasters like Bob are going to be a thing of the past, that we're not going to see that anymore. You know, a, a genuine journalist working as a broadcaster at a network. I don't think we're going to see it that much. Um, uh, I can't say enough about him and just how great he's been to me and how much he sort of made World Cups for me, the ones that I've watched in America, like, you know, truly, truly work. And that's with the greatest respect. Like, we love Mike Tirico. We love... Um, but Mike was much more of a Mike is much more of a sports journalist. You know his great quality is he can cover anything and talk about anything. Bob was almost and it, obviously Bob covered a lot of sports and outside the lines. But Bob was a soccer specialist as an anchor and was so good at it. Did he ever disclose a Premier League alliance? Do you know what? I don't believe he ever did. I'm not sure he ever had one. What an absolute professional. <laughs> Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbiased through and through. Yeah. I don't mm. believe he had one. I don't right. believe he had one. If he had one, it would be somebody, that, unfortunately, like our next opponent's Wolverhampton Wanderers. It would be someone odd, someone you wouldn't particularly expect. Yeah, I, I could see that. Well, obviously, you've had the chance to see the support of America's sport of the future since 1972. Soccer, um, you've seen it grow in person. You've seen the rise of the Premier League and support for clubs, you know, United, Madrid, even Tottenham, kind of claim the hearts and minds of the American soccer public. So why do you think Chelsea hasn't achieved this similar popularity despite literally owning London for over the last decade? (laughs) just always seem to kind of be the bad boys in London. That's interesting. I think that Chelsea, um, I think Chelsea have actually been a victim to some extent of their success is American fans don't want to be seen as bandwagon. And so Tottenham became the most obvious choice for American fans is that they're in London, but they're not that good. They feel like an underdog. They play in a color that is not threatening to anybody. It's white. Um, <laughs> Um, it's lily white. I know lily white. Exactly. (laughs) Um, so I think that it was a, you know, that's part of it. Um, and I think they're a victim of success. People didn't want to feel like they're bandwagon, like following the Yankees or following the Patriots. It was, uh, it was, it, it was a lot of that. And then I think that criticism, even as they were doing that, Chelsea did not play the most attractive football. Um, you know, Chelsea would like run right through you, like the spine of those great teams in 04, 05, 05, 06. They just literally demolished you. They scored a lot of goals, but they didn't do it with the kind of Mo Salah cuteness. It wasn't that kind of, uh, it wasn't that kind of football. We didn't have managers who could really inspire you. Mourinho was never, I mean, I loved him for a moment. It's like an ex-girlfriend who I, I accept that I loved, but I don't love anymore. And I'm really glad is out of my life. 
Um, <laughs> he, uh, he didn't inspire a lot of passion amongst people who are meeting him for the first time. Um, but I think that Chelsea are getting back. I think we're going to see an explosion partly because of the Pulisic thing in America. So I think a lot of people are going to become much bigger Chelsea fans. But I think also they're so fun to watch right now. And it's easy to get behind these kids. It's just fun. You know, we haven't fielded teams this young since the, you know, early 1990s. And that was only by mistake, like halfway through a season when everybody was injured. You know, this is a, these are fascinating um, every week. It's like, it's been years since I like looked at Chelsea lineups and thought, wow, look who's playing this week. You know, it's fun. It's really fun. Mikel, obviously. Yeah, exactly. He could be back, but it'll be his son. <laughs> Oh, um, yeah, so we just witnessed the U.S. women's team win another World Cup. Surprise, surprise. We also Amazing. saw the Women's Soccer League kick off its opening weekend. Chelsea women beat the Tottenham ladies over a crowd, a crowd of over 25,000 people at Stamford at, Bridge. At Stamford Bridge. Amazing. Um, but beyond just giving away, obviously, the, the free tickets or maybe even streaming the game so people can watch them whenever, wherever, you know, what do you think, maybe looking at the women's game in England, they need to be doing to continue to grow it um, in the way that the Premier League has grown in, you know, in our hearts and minds? Um, look, personally, I think, I think that the Premier League um, and women's domestic football in England has massive potential. And I think it has massive potential as a TV product as well. Um, I would not be surprised if the club start tying the renewal of broadcast rights around the world to broadcasting of the women's games as well. I think I you like could that. really Ooh. see that happen. Um, and that would pour some money into the game that would be even more money. Money's coming in, but it would pour even more money into the game, which I think would be a really good thing. Um, the, of course, the, the casualty of that would be the US domestic women's game in terms of the domestic leagues. And I think that has been an enormous squandered opportunity by U.S. soccer and by U.S. brands, frankly, who could have backed and built on the back of the 99ers and successive amazing U.S. women's team. I think they could have built a successful league here. And we've seen it happen in some cities, but not in others. And, but I think the money that's going to pour into this game from the European clubs right now is going to dwarf what can happen in America. And I think when they start tying it to broadcast rights, over um i think we're still going to see huge opportunities for american female players to go and play on these clubs in europe as they already are going but i think it does spell the end of or a potential end to the american women's league or not to the end of the league but to a it will not be a it will not be the premier league in women's soccer kind of that household name yeah you did mention uh, and we think about crystal dunn did play for the chelsea women's team previously if you think about it, is there any one player from the existing U.S. women's team that you'd like to see as a, a figure who would join the Chelsea women's team that you'd love to see and get to root for in a different way? Other than Hope Solo. Um, <laughs> just for pure entertainment purposes. Um, uh, I think probably, I mean, I love Megan. I think Megan is a star. I'd love to see Megan go anywhere. But the player that electrified me on the U.S. women's team at the World Cup and who I've met since and the door is Rose Lavelle. Uh, I'd love to yeah. see Rose Lavelle in Chelsea Blue. You know, I'd love to see those sort of, you know, you know, for a not particularly tall girl, she has very long legs. That sort of that sort of like Ian Hutchison style. I think she is like sort of a rangy winger. I'd love to see I'd love to see Rose in Chelsea Blue. Flattering to her skin complexion, I feel. <laughs> uh, very pale, yes. Yeah. Um, Okay, so so final question of this round would be um, just thinking about all the time that you spent traveling the country with men and blazers or just independently. Um, you, you kind of have seen these unique soccer cultures pop up all over the country. We think it's one of the most interesting things about how the game has kind of grown here. Uh, we live in three of the very best soccer markets um, in, in, you know, in the country, in Minneapolis, yeah. Seattle, and KC. You don't have to say one of these places, but do you have a favorite spot that you visited or, or a place that you think is really, really special? <laughs> Juicy Lucy. <clears throat> <clears throat> Barbecue. <throat> um, do you know what's interesting? Rain. Yeah, all three of the places you live are phenomenal for soccer. 
Um, but I'd have to say that um, I actually think that the interesting thing that's going on or potentially the important thing um, going on is the growth of the game in the American South. And I think what's happened in Atlanta, mm-hmm. what's about to be happening in Nashville, um, and God willing, what happens in Miami, because that's, re- I, think what, I think Miami is actually really important for Major League Soccer. Um, I actually would, perhaps an unpopular opinion, but I think the future of Major League Soccer is going to be determined on the success of the, of the Miami franchise. Um, and I think those markets are really important. Um, so I love every city you guys live in, and I swear to you, I'd be honest if I didn't. There are some American soccer cities that I don't love, um, I'd love visiting, um, and actually, you know, Kansas city has a great hotel. That museum hotel is like mind blowing. Um, and Minneapolis, we were blown away with the crowd there in Seattle. We've probably been to more than anywhere else we've been. It's like, it's so special what goes on there. Um, but I think what's going on in the American South is significant and going to Nashville this year, um, going to Atlanta a few times, that's been like whoa, these are like proper football towns. And so I think we've seen the Northwest has been like that for ages. I think what's happening down South is phenomenal right now. Love the overall popularity. I was just talking to my girlfriend's family who live in Atlanta. They're like, oh, you like soccer? You should come check out Atlanta. I'm like, I know. I've seen yeah. it. It's amazing. Like, yeah, it's so on good. the list. Yeah. All right. Well, again, those have all been amazing. We're going to tighten it up in the lightning round. How about that? Okay. Wrap this one up. Just quick. lightning round. On a just quick instinctual answers. Okay. Um, so, you know, obviously we're taking a bit of a page out of your book as your career executive producer. So we game thought we'd you know, play a game. Okay, good. Um, and put you through some of the different uh, managers who've worked at our Chelsea, at Chelsea under Roman Abramovich. And uh, <laughs> we'd like to hear what TV show you describe the term as. So, uh, you know, just right away, a nice little casual start to it. We can do Jose Mourinho. 2004 to 2007. Whoa. Or even um, just like an initial reaction, because I know you guys like music. Any kind of... I mean, it's sort, of, it's, it, it's, it's sort of like the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, is, is Mourinho. He just like, he was the biggest, most powerful thing in the world and then lost it all before he came back again. But like, yeah. Um, yeah, he's billions. I mean, Mourinho is billions. He is Shakespearean in every single way. Every week, whether he was winning, losing, whatever was going on, it was just a fight to the death. And it was a battle for respect. And um, just, it's like watching a a, a primetime TV drama every single week. What about the second spell? 13-14? Or 13-16, I mean. Um, Your lover came back. Yeah. A little bit weird watching it come back. It's kind of like, remember when Arrested Development came back on another network? Did it come back on like Hulu it's or something? Yeah. It's it was perfect. perfect. It was still good, but it wasn't quite the same. It's just like, it was sort of that. That's what I'd say is the, the second spell. It's perfect. All right. So the next one, Antonio Conte comes in, has his spell. What would you describe the, uh, the immediate success and then the middling second year? Yeah, I'd sort of say that was House Hunters International, one of my favorite <laughs> TV shows of all time. Um, believe me, I've binged House Hunters International. I enjoyed the Antonio Conte era, but I knew it, it wasn't something that was ever going to last. It wasn't going to be something that was any other than House Hunters International, even if you binge seven episodes in a, in a row, it doesn't fill you up. It's not like watching Planet Earth. Um, and so Antonio Conte was a little bit to me, and he probably will be house hunting internationally for the rest of his career. <laughs> <laughs> That's well done. All right. To, to another Italian, we've had a few of them. Uh, Carlo Ancelotti. Carlo Ancelotti. Um, Carlo Ancelotti. Carlo Ancelotti. I mean, sort of for me, it's, as, it's sort of like world news tonight. He's sort of joyless, Carlo Ancelotti. He's a, even when we were winning, even when the news was good, there was nothing, there was nothing fun about the Ancelotti era. We obviously won the Premier League with him, right? In 2010. Yeah, um, double. yeah, but it was still a little bit like world news tonight. It was not the most thrilling 
um, era, the most thrilling football. And if you've met him, he's a very serious guy. He's not super fun to be around. Like you want like a really fun, heavy drinking Italian. That's not Carlo. Carlo is like quite serious. I mean, we haven't met him, but uh, nice, nice name drop there. No, well, I only actually met him because I was on a train. I was on the Eurostar coming back from Paris on my 50th birthday. And uh, my friends, and not me, but my friends had drunk way too much and probably indulged in multiple other substances and were just behaving like idiots on the train and got told off by Carlo Ancelotti. And to almost uh, make it up, I started talking to him a little bit about football and, and being nice to him. But um, yeah, he's, he didn't really like our group. He didn't enjoy us that day. All right. Um, I, I, I'm a little afraid that I was drawn this card, but uh, Maurizio Sarri, 2018 to 2019. What is my least favorite TV show of all time? <laughs> That's a tough question. The show that I loathe more than any other TV show. Actually, it should be a show I love that was just handled incredibly, incredibly <laughs> That's probably a better way to look at it. Season eight of Game of Thrones. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was never a really big Game of Thrones fan. My man, me either. You know, um, you know, one of my favorite TV shows of all time, American TV shows, is um, I've Got a Secret, the classic panel show of the 1960s in America, 50s, mm -hmm. 60s. Um, and that was brought back a few times in the era of color television, and it was just awful. But that's maybe not the right example. What do I loathe even more than that? Do you know all of those USA dramas like Suits and um, what was that FX show, Burn Notice, which like, who knows what uh, that was yeah. about? Like, it's like, to me, it was like, Sari's football made, it was like one of those USA dramas. It was like, it just made no sense to me. There was no point to it i just never saw the point of sari ball i never really believed it um i'm really interested to see what he does in italy whether he's any good over there it's like a yeah it was awful it was awful he decided on what his ca cast of characters were what the script what the storyline was during preseason, and then he completely failed to rotate his squad from the players who turned up for him at preseason. and even with all of the evidence of other players being extraordinarily good like ruben loftus cheek and then, by the way, and I know this isn't really his fault, but the fact that Ruben, they played that pointless postseason game in Boston in which Ruben Loftus-Cheek got injured, it's like, I'm, I'm done. I'm, honestly, I'm so glad to see him go. Last one. Uh, might be a little early to give it a show, but I, I, we think he can do it, do it justice. Frank Lampard's reign, or at least the start of it. Not the player power, you know, in the late 2000s. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um... Frank Lampard, what is he going to be as a TV show? Um, I was going to say Prodigal Son, which is that new show going on CBS, but it's actually about a, a serial killer. Um, <laughs> so, uh, oh, wow. Frank Lampard, TV show. Um, I mean, maybe to sort of take something from sort of my oeuvre, it's like, who wants to be a millionaire? Because if he pulls it off, He's going to be making fortunes for the rest of his life. He's going to be making bank. He's going to make multi-millionaires of a lot of these young players. He's going to make Chelsea, which I believe they've got the capacity to do because of the beauty of that brand, that color blue, the natural appeal, how big they could be in America if he can get the best out of Christian. Um, I think Chelsea is a sort of powerhouse brand. He could be making that, you know, the next Manchester United, you know, and with Manchester United in such you know, problems. Um, you don't ever really see Man City being um, a massive, global, inspiring football brand. I don't. I see it as being a little bit too sovereign wealth run. Um, I think that Liverpool are an amazing brand, but Liverpool are, are, are somewhat so proud of their own history and so... Um, and so in, a little bit insular and a little bit other. I don't ever see them becoming that sort of big global machine. Chelsea do amazing business. You know, Chelsea just dropped 10 loan players and made something like 178 million pounds, like $250 million. They're a, they do amazing business. And I think that 
with Frank in there, with these academy players coming up, with the success that he could achieve at the club, with just his story about the, you know, returning home and conquering. Um, I think it could be, uh, I think this could spell dollar signs, dollar signs, dollar signs for Chelsea, which will just make people hate us more. But I just don't care because winning trophies feels so good. I mean, it's actually the best feeling ever, which winning is why, you know, it's why Roman does what he does. Like he has one goal, one ambition, and it is to win competitions and trophies. And Chelsea have been an amazing benefactor for that. And uh, long we're, may it live. Yeah, we're really good at winning. Winning trophies is everything. It um, is. What That's is what the players point of remember. Yeah, what is the point of professional sports if you're not winning titles? There's just no point in professional sports. It's why I loathe the sort of, you know, the fourth place trophy, the um, the idea of a high mid-table finish. You know, it's a, the point is to win. Not every team in the league can win the league every year, but it's a special thing. And I think we devalue it. And when we sort of congratulate a bunch of teams for having a great season, when they did not win it, like you've got to win things. Winning is, to me, Everything. the point of professional sports. Bravo. Well, um, that's it for us. Thank you, Thank you. so much. It's I'm been delightful to guys. chat. Thank you, Thank you. Yeah, I loved it. Obviously, if you've been hiding under rock, go check out Raj and Devo on the Men and Blazers podcast. Then check them out on TV. Obviously, podcasts come first all over social media. But again, just thank you. Thank you. Um, looking forward to continue to follow you guys this season. I hope all of your adventures take you where you want. And uh, as you said, as you join the call, up the chels. Come on, up the chels.